Al Jazeera podcast. Narendra Modi is no stranger to headline-grabbing events. But last summer, the Indian Prime Minister celebrated his 72nd birthday in particularly extravagant style. And you can see that flight that is now going to land at any moment now. Five females, three male cheetahs being brought from Namibia. Prime Minister is releasing these eight cats into the quarantine enclosure and he is photographing them himself. If you do know, he's a DSLR enthusiast and he's taken out his camera for this special occasion. Eight cheetahs flown in from Namibia, joined this year by 12 more from South Africa. It's known as Project Cheetah. The initiative brought the big cats back to India 70 years after they went extinct there due to hunting and a loss of habitat and prey. But Project Cheetah hasn't been going so well. There were concerns about the legality from the very beginning and serious questions about the science. Now, eight cheetahs have died, including two from the cheetah unveiling on Modi's birthday. Breaking news that's coming in, India's cheetah crisis has become worse. Male cheetah Suraj, one of the 20 cheetahs brought in from Africa to Kuno National Park, has been found dead. Remember, it is the eighth cheetah to have died since relocation. So what's to blame for these cheetah deaths? And what can be done to stop them? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. A cheetah is a large cat, probably the lankiest of the large cat. It's slight in build. It's the smallest in terms of weight. It's an animal primarily of the open plains. Um, It's a causer, meaning it chases its prey. That's Ravi Chalam, a well-known wildlife biologist and conservation scientist in India. And as you can tell, he knows a lot about the world's fastest mammal. Most of the other large cats are stalkers. I mean... They, they kind of ambush predators, was the cheetah is out in the open chasing its prey. So long legs, the fastest land mammal. It's no surprise then that Ravi has been following the recent wave of cheetah deaths in India closely. And it's why I'm talking to him today. So Ravi, let's talk about Project Cheetah. It is an initiative that's brought 20 cheetahs from Africa to India in the past year. And a lot of people were really excited about it. Who doesn't love a cheetah? Majestic, charismatic, fascinating. Cheetahs from Namibia have arrived in India and will be introduced into Madhya Pradesh's Kuno National Park on Prime Minister Narendra Modi's birthday. The project costs roughly $11 million over a five-year period, but it hasn't gone very well. Five of those cheetahs, as well as three cubs, have all died since coming to India. And this is all happening in Kuno National Park. So can you set the scene for me? Where are we talking about in India and why here? Kuno National Park is a part of a fairly large tract of forest in northwestern Madhya Pradesh central western India, bordering the state of Rajasthan. The national park itself is about 750 square kilometers, but it's set in a larger wildlife division of about 1,250 square kilometers. It's a semi-arid forest, thorn forest, very diverse habitats, so it gets about 750, 760 millimeters of rainfall annually. Summers do get very hot, upwards of 42 degrees centigrade, and winters are in the region of uh, single digit and centigrade. Mm. Have you been before? I am in some sense um, the cause of all of this. Ravi's referring to research he did back in the 1980s, focused on another big cat, the lion. The idea was to translocate them because all our lions in Asia are currently found in a single location. And post my PhD, I went and did a survey to try and find out suitable habitats for lions and we picked Kuno, based on good uh, reasons. And from 1995, the government of India has actually been managing Kuno to translocate and reintroduce lions there. So how did we get from the lions and your research to cheetahs? 
I mean, the cheetah, after all, is a charismatic, adorable animal. <laughs> so it is going to get a lot of attention. But actually, the cheetah story goes back quite a bit. India lost its last cheetahs. I mean, the official record says 1952, but there are stragglers reported as late as 1965, 69, something like that. But the government wanted to bring back the cheetah. So in the late 60s, early 70s, there was fairly high-level discussion between Iran, which was the stronghold of uh, cheetahs in Asia, and India. It was a barter of India giving lions to Iran, and Iran in turn uh, giving us cheetahs. Mm. But political developments at both ends overtook all of this. India declared emergency. Imposed on the night of 25th June 1975 by then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, it suspended fundamental rights of citizens and triggered large-scale protests against the dictatorial methods of the government. The Shah of Iran was deposed. Chaotic celebrations erupted in Tehran when the news broke the Shah had gone. It was like Liberation Day. Clearly, large cats were not in the minds of the government. Mm -hmm. Since then, uh, there were attempts to clone the Asiatic cheetah. That didn't go anywhere. <laughs> From about 2009, there's been a revival. There was an international meeting and government of India decided to bring the cheetahs. Mm. But the Supreme Court in 2013 said the order of the government of India to bring cheetahs from Africa was illegal because it hadn't followed due process. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it cannot take priority over the lions. Mm. But subsequently, they went on appeal. And here we are. The cats came on the 17th of September last year, mm. the first batch of them. I see. Well, that brings me to my next question. You had cautioned against this project before it even started. You had a number of concerns. So let's start with the concerns about the cheetah themselves and the park. What were you concerned about? I mean, for the moment, let's leave aside the genetic and disease risks. The problem is the whole thing is based on unsubstantiated premises and claims mm. that the cheetahs have run out of space in Africa, that Africa actually has a surplusing population which is not true, mm -hmm. and that India has sufficient and suitable space, habitats, to host these cheetahs, which is also not true, mm. and that conservation translocations have been successful in the wild, establishing cheetah populations uh, through restoration, which is also not true. The project proponents themselves are saying that there is not a single case where they have succeeded in releasing cheetahs in unfenced habitats. The only success has been in fenced habitats. India does not do conservation using fences. And the problems don't end there, including the size of Kuno National Park. There are scientific foundations which are very, very weak. This whole project is ecologically unsound. The natural density of cheetahs is less than 1 per 100 square kilometers. They are animals having very large home ranges, 750 square kilometers to 1600 square kilometers. Mm -hmm. Wow. So whatever the habitat quality is, they need that space. So they grossly overcalculated the capacity of a Kuno. So you have this weak scientific foundation mm -hmm. matched or married with completely unrealistic conservation goals. Ravi also says the cheetah project has had an effect on other animals in India, including a bird called the Great Indian Bustard. The global population, most of it in India is estimated something like 150 birds, mm. they are dying because of lack of attention. Threatened by poaching, poor land management, and negative attitudes to conservation, the great Indian bustard is disappearing fast. Cheetahs have distracted conservation dialogue implementation in India. Over the last 18 months, almost anything to do with wildlife has been about cheetahs. Interesting. So, attention is diverted, funds have been diverted. It's a highly expensive project. Most of our other wildlife projects suffer from funding constraints. So, you listed your concerns there. And as of now, eight cheetah deaths have already happened. Has this gone even worse than you could have predicted? In some sense, I would say yes. I don't have any ill will towards these cheetahs. I wish they hadn't died. But let's look at the facts. The cheetahs were supposed to be in quarantine for four weeks after they arrived. That's international standard, no problem. Then they were supposed to be in a larger enclosure, what they call a hunting boma, 
for between four to eight weeks. So they came on 17th of September. So by about 17th of November, this period of captivity in one form or the other should have ended. But it didn't end till about mid-March, a good 90 days later. So these animals have been in prolonged captivity much longer than they should have been. And don't forget, they were already in captivity in Africa for several months before they came to India. Hmm. I definitely did not anticipate so many deaths in captivity. I did anticipate the recent spate of problems with radio collars. What is a radio collar? A radio collar is a transmitting device for a cat. You tie it around its neck using a belt. What it allows is for you to track it. Uh, finding a wild cat in the wild is really difficult. It's the proverbial needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. And for research, you need to find animals regularly. And nowadays, of course, you have what's called as GPS, satellite monitored collars. You can set it for every 15 minutes, every hour or every two hours, and you will get a position on the map. So this way, you know what the animal is doing, what is its health condition, or how it is socializing, which part of the habitat it's using, and so on. But the cats have developed lesions in the neck. Oh, It's the monsoon season now, so it's heavy rains. Mm -hmm. And those lesions are getting infected, oh, maggot no. infested. Oh my gosh. And to prevent further deaths, they're bringing them into captivity. That's awful. The Indian government has referred to reports that cheetahs have died because of the radio collars as hearsay and said all the deaths have been a result of natural causes. The government also told the Supreme Court last week that the number of deaths so far was not alarming, that cheetah deaths during relocation was anticipated. But critics aren't buying it. So is there any way to change the course of Project Cheetah? More on that after the break. So Ravi, you've said in the past that this is about poor science. Is it that politics has turned this into a prestige project for the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, to the extent that the science appears to be cast aside? Well, there are a lot of eminent scientists involved, and it's a very public, high-profile project. And by their association, they are lending it credibility at one level and they are staking their reputations at another level. For me, especially the role of the international scientists have been quite uh, shameful and unethical. I think many involved suffer from delusions of grandeur. <laughs> they are pursuing their own agendas to grab the limelight is, is the polite way I can put it. Mm. And they should know they all are cheetah expert in some form or the other. They've disregarded, diluted all ecological knowledge on cheetahs. Hmm. So does politics play into this at all? Politicians are definitely involved. Uh, these are uh, bilateral arrangements that India and South Africa have entered into, India and Namibia have entered into. Beyond that, again, um, what can I say? I mean, I have way before the cheetahs coming into India uh, stated that uh, this is a vanity project. Mm. And the likely outcome is that, you, at best, we'll get glorified safari parks. <laughs> huh. Ravi, earlier we were talking about your original research, which was on the lions. And many conservationists, including you, have been trying to get endangered lions moved to Kuno National Park. How have the cheetahs ended up there instead? Can you walk us through what happened? So based on my doctoral research, I did a survey and in January 95, presented my recommendations through the Wildlife Institute of India to the government of India, which is accepted. Mm. And from April of 1995, Kuno has been managed for lions. More than 1,500 families of tribal people have been relocated, resettled, to create a core of about 750 square kilometers as a national park to build up the prey, build management capacity, and get it ready for lions. But it never actually happened. The lions are currently in the state of Gujarat. And though they were supposed to be moved, they're still there. The government of Gujarat had 
stalled the translocation on one whimsical reason or the other and a public spirited citizen went to the court in a uh, supreme court in uh, 2006 using what's called as a public interest litigation and said so much money has been spent so many people have been relocated why aren't the lines translocated and through those hearings one of the reasons government of gujarat gave was we heard that cheetahs are coming to uh, india from africa that two to kuno cheetahs are much less powerful smaller than lions let the cheetahs come first let them settle down then we can talk about translocation of lions the court got incensed it said lions are in india you're not willing to conserve or put the required attention on them but willing to bring uh cheetahs from africa and the order which was issued in 2013 basically called the plan to bring cheetahs from africa illegal and said in 6 months the lions need to move so the intentions of government of gujarat was very clear going back to 2012 mm. but then you have the then chief minister is the current prime minister chief minister gujarat i don't know whether there's any links to it but we find that the cheetah project has got a second wind so did the government just ignore that supreme court ruling or what happened the national tiger conservation authority went on an appeal to the supreme court and said that The order of 2013 is seen as a blanket ban on cheetahs coming from Africa but actually it is not it's just saying no cheetahs to kuno we will not disturb kuno we will not look at kuno allow us to explore other habitats but it was also the time of the pandemic and they kind of played games around here uh, smoke and mirror and waving hands and so on and you find that all the focus has been on kuno the action plan really talks only about kuno and the cheetahs have all gone to kuno So it is incorrect, wrong, unacceptable in so many ways that we have not moved the lines as per the Supreme Court order, but somehow conveniently found a way to, within court, smuggle in the cheetah into Kuno. What do you think this will mean for the lions going forward? Well, continued enhanced risks. In 2018, there was a cyclone which killed a few lions. See. We are living in an extremely uncertain world. I mean, climate change, extreme weather events, forest fires, disease outbreaks. We're tempting fate by not doing the right thing. Not doing the right thing by ecological principles, by conservation biology principles, by following rule of law. I don't really want to imagine a scenario where it goes wrong because that could erode more than a century of very active conservation. The lines are up. crowning glory of our conservation success hmm. and if we neglect that decades of work will slide back in a matter of few months if you had been a cheerleader of this project what do you think you would be thinking now i mean do you think there is still a way forward i wish there was it's like trying to build a house without a foundation hmm. or an inadequate foundation We have clearly put the cart before the horse. Cheetahs are amongst the large cats, lowest in hierarchy, and the most demanding in terms of space. If you don't have adequate space and adequate quality habitats, whatever you do, you will never have free-ranging wild cheetahs. You can always have them behind fences. Then say that's what it is. So my call on this is. manage as best as you can with whatever surviving cheetahs we have stop further imports and there's clearly a role for the south african and uh, namibian national governments they need to take a good look at this do they want to keep adhering to within court sacrifice these cheetahs by sending more across to india and from our side we really need a more inclusive and participatory approach i mean this project is not transparent and so far i've not seen enough accountability and i hear they even issued a gag order to the international scientists saying only the national tiger conservation authority can talk publicly and that too in writing about the project wow you know this conversation is kind of depressing i i feel i i started it thinking a population of people might be able to see an animal that went extinct in their home although of course when when humans are involved there is always still danger and disaster that follows but are there any bright spots to what's actually not a very happy story huh <laughs> that size says it all perhaps not it, perhaps not 
I mean, I think uh, we should have the maturity and uh, largeness of heart to accept the mistakes we have made and not keep compounding our errors. Yeah, right. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Ashish Malhotra and Sonia Bagat, with Khalid Sultan, Amy Walters, Berenice Campana, Miranda Lynn, Chloe K. Lee, David Enders, Zaina Bazar, and me, Malika Bilal. Alex Roldan is our sound designer. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back.